I just really do believe, you know, I know that the, the goal was to raise up the church, members of the body of Christ, to be able to move in their gifts, to edify and build up, to encourage, to show God's presence on this earth and in our lives and in others' lives, to encourage them to seek the Lord. Um, so I just thought we needed to review a few things. A couple of things I want to say is what, um, for those of you who have never been here before or if you don't know what we do, um, prophecy is a gift of the Holy Spirit given to God's children. Uh, if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, if you're saved and redeemed by the blood of Christ, then you're a candidate to move in the gift of the Holy Spirit. There are a multitude of gifts, and the one we focus on is the gift of prophecy, but there's also discerning of spirits, there's healing. Um, my mind has gone completely blank. Healing, prophecy, um, miracles, um, tongues and interpretation, words of knowledge and words of wisdom. Thank you, Melinda. <laughs> Yeah, there's seven, but seven, eight, nine, nine, nine gifts. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but we want to, what, what prophecy, let me tell you what prophecy is not. We are not soothsayers in the worldly sense of being a soothsayer. We are not a magic eight ball. We are not a, a carnival character that you can go in fortune tellers. We're not fortune tellers. We don't read um, crystal balls. We, we don't, uh, we're, not, we're not of that. We are Christians that love God, that listen to his voice, that know when he's speaking to us so we can encourage others. But we're not, we're not a place to come to be told what you have to do or uh, necessarily what's going to happen tomorrow. That's not our job. Our job is to encourage, to build up, to speak to you God's heart for you, which is a heart of love, a heart of compassion, a heart that cares about who you are, the, a heart that wants the best for you. And we want to encourage you to walk in the best that God has for you. But we are not fortune tellers and we're not here uh, to come and uh, tell you the lottery numbers or uh, which horse to bet on in the Kentucky Derby. We don't do that. We're not going to tell you who your husband or your wife is, and we're not going to tell you uh, if you're pregnant, if you're going to have a boy or a girl. We don't do that. <laughs> now, certain instances, God may move on somebody and give them a real strong impression about maybe your baby, but one thing we want to avoid is uh, prophesying marriages. That is a very dangerous area to fall into, very dangerous. God will confirm it to the, the man and the woman. You don't have to get involved in that. You can pray with them that God bring along the right uh, mate, that God's working on them, that he's going to provide for them, but you don't tell them who it is. And we don't prophesy, give me all your money. So, and if there's a prophet that's ever told you, I know there have been stories of uh, prophets that have told people, well, what you're supposed to do is sell your house and give your money to me. Yeah, okay. Um, I don't think so. <sighs> Thank you, Jesus. What are prophets and prophecies? Prophetesses. Ephesians 4, 11, and 12 says, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. There are two worldly concepts of who a prophet is or what a prophet does or the prophetic ministry. One is an old, wild eye, crazy person that runs around with wild hair and dresses in animal skins. They live in a cave. They hate everybody, they're mad at the world, and they only come out and tell you, prophesy doom and gloom and tell you to repent and crawl back in their, grave, in their cave. That's not what we do or we are. Another concept is that they're seen as socially concerned preachers, those who speak out on current issues, who preaches ecological and not theological. And ecology is the science that dealing with the relationship between living organisms and the environment. And 
in a lot of areas and a lot of churches, the prophetic is faced with a lot of criticism from the mainstream, mainstream churches. And I know, um, I know enough to know if you don't know if a prophet is of God or not, stay away from it. And by that I mean don't comment on it, don't condemn them, don't curse them, don't speak evil of them, pray for them, but don't put yourself in a position where you are judging someone when you, you're not sure of the spirit now. Be very careful about that. Uh, the restoration of the prophet has been prophesied in Acts 3, 19 and 21. It says there's going to be a restoration of all things. So the church has been founded on the apostles of prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And the apostles and the prophets are the foundation of the church. So we believe that every church should have prophetic and apostle foundation. This church has a prophetic and an apostolic foundation. It was built on prophecy. God prophesied to, to the pastor, that God prophesied over the church by many different prophets, not just one or two, but many different prophets. Uh, the leadership believed what the prophet says, and here we are today. Um, a lot of people fear the prophets because they don't understand prophetic ministry, and they're afraid they're going to... Uh, con we're not going to call out sin. That's not our job. We do not, we do not, when we're praying for you, we do not call out any sin if God would happen to show us something. Now, I'm not saying that he even does, but he, we're not going to call that out. That's between you and the Lord. What we want to do is encourage you to seek God and get things straightened out. And I believe God will give you a word that, that will encourage you, maybe turn you in the right direction. You may be going the wrong way and maybe the Lord's gonna say something that's confirming what God has been speaking to your heart about what you need to do about something. But we're not gonna, we're not gonna call out sin. We're not gonna call out failure. We're not here to do that. We are here to encourage, to edify you and to build you up. The prophet's ministry is marked more by the revelational gifts of the word of knowledge, the gift of prophecy, the word of wisdom, coupled with the gift of discernment, and is not known for great public speaking. <laughs> Remember, the, the uh, existence of one ministry depends on the others being in existence. You can't be second if there's not a first. You can't be third if there's not a, you can't be th first if there's not a second. But you can't be third if there's not a second. God has said in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, government, diversities of tongues. So we have to have the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, the teachers, and then we get the gifts, the healing, the helps, the governments, the diversity of tongues. Foundation precedes revelation and revelation precedes teaching. Prophets are not teachers, but they can teach. A prophet is one who speaks revelation to the church. They are those whom God speaks forth revelation through. And the prophet has been um, theolog theologized, theo theologized, the theologized out of existence. They've been called uh, cults, part of a cult. They've been told to be quiet. They don't believe in. Uh, they've been misinterpreted and replaced. So... The prophet, the time of the prophet has been restored. I think it's been restored, and we're going to walk in that. Some, amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. I hope you all understand that um, the last year has been very hard for me. Uh, not just in this venue, but in other things. Um, I just covet your prayers for what's going on in my life. Right now I have a family member living with me that's going through cancer treatment, so I'm kind of responsible for them with all the other responsibilities that I have, so I would certainly do appreciate and covet your prayers. Now, last month, um, 
Dave and Kathy Andrus, uh, Larry Brewer, <clears throat> excuse me, Larry Brewer and I were privileged to go to uh, Christian International's International Conference of Apostles and Prophets, and we got to hear some wonderful speakers. And um, one of the things that uh, Bishop Hammond said, and, and in, in case you don't know, even if you're members of this church and you don't know, uh, Brother Monrad and actually I both were ordained ministers through Christian International. We, are, we were ordained by Prophet or Apostle Bill Hammond, Bishop Bill Hammond. So that's just a, an old history of the church. But uh, Bishop Hammond spoke, and one of the things he said, and I've kind of chewed on this, and I don't know if that, I've, that I understand what he meant, but what he said was, if you've made it through the last year, if you've made it through COVID, then you're gonna be able to make it through what's coming. Now, I chewed on that and I thought, okay, if you made it through COVID, and I took that to mean, if you didn't lose your faith in God, if you didn't cower in fear, if you continued to trust God and stand on his word, that was a test to see if you would do that. And if that is something you were able to do or that's something you've done, then whatever it is that we are facing in the future, you're standing on a solid foundation of the promises and the word of God. So just take that, meditate on it, think about it. If you feel like God has shown you anything else that he meant, you know, let's talk about it. Let me know what you think. Uh, but I don't think, he, because uh, actually he had COVID. He was hospitalized with COVID. So I don't think he means if you, had, if you didn't have COVID. I don't think that was what he meant. I think what he meant was if you, if you continued to trust God and believe God and you didn't, one of the biggest things is fear. You need to not walk in fear. I can't, I look around and I'm just amazed at the number of people that are absolutely fearful. It's not, um, it's not that they're, well, I just don't know about that. I'm talking about people that are fearful. They won't come out of their house. They won't, they won't move and do things that they did before. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love, a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. So if you keep your mind set on Christ, if you keep your eyes on Jesus, you're not gonna fall, you're not gonna fail, and God's gonna hold you up. He's gonna guide you, direct you, and protect you. Um, and I remember what I heard recently about what the word testimony means in Hebrew and what it actually signifies. You know, it says in, in Revelation, we overcome him by the, the word of our testimony. What the Hebrew word means is when you testify, they, they use David as an example. When he killed the lion and the bear as a young shepherd, when he was shepherding the sheep, and he killed that lion and that, and that bear, when he was facing Goliath, he looked at Goliath and he said, or he declared to even the, his brothers and the other soldiers and Saul, he declared to them, I've killed the lion, God delivered the lion and the bear to me, and God's going to deliver this giant to me. And when you give your testimony, his testimony was, God gave, God killed the lion and uh, God allowed me to kill the lion and the bear. When he said that, he opened the door for God to do it again. So remember your testimony. If God has ever healed you of anything, testify what God has healed you of, and God's gonna open that door and do it again. That he will heal you again, and he will heal you again. So our testimony is very important. It's something to encourage us, it's something to encourage others. So, so you know, maybe we need to talk about what God's done a whole lot more. We don't hear that so much anymore. Susan Hinkle is full of testimony. I know she is, and I know Malayne is full of testimony. I'm sure Marie and Merle are full of testimony. The people I know are full of testimony. I'm sure Kelly is full of testimony, and I know Diana is full of testimony, and Kathy and David of what God has done in their lives, and Michael. There's testimonies all over this room, and Keith. If I left you out, I'm sorry, but there are testimonies. I think we need to hear those testimonies. As a matter of fact, who wants to testify what God's done? All righty, come up here and tell me, or tell us all. Oh. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get two or three up here. Here you go. Hello. Here you go. Oh, thank you. Uh -huh. 
Um, my name's Tina. Actually, I know Larry Burr. I'm from Legacy Church in Salem, Indiana. Um, I'm a recovering drug addict. I've been clean. I've been at Legacy Church for 10 years, but I slipped. And But I've been clean for the last two years. I have started an outreach program uh, called God's Love, and I give out toothbrushes and stuff like that to the homeless, drug addicts, because I know a lot of drug addicts. And I've also started a soup kitchen at Legacy. And Larry has encouraged me to come and visit. And that's what I'm doing here tonight. And I have friends that are with me, another Tina and a Sarah. So we just wanted to visit, say hey. <laughs> so it's good to be here, and thank you. But God has really, he's an amazing thing. While I was a drug addict, I went to jail three times. I got with a guy that was not good. And I lost, I, did, I never lost my faith in God when I was going through the process. I was always praying to help me get a way out, help me find, Lord, just help me get out of this. And I kind of just lost my way after about six, six, seven years in the church. And this guy walked into my life. The enemy caught me off guard and, and, and brought this guy into my life that was not any good. And he had a drug problem, a 22-year drug problem. At the time, I didn't know it. But I'm re a recovering drug addict. Uh, two years and I praise the Father so much every day. And, and thank you, Lord, for what you're doing and for changing my life and for giving me the ability to do the things I'm doing now and be able to talk to people and help them because service is in my heart. I love doing that now. But thank you so much. And thank you for allowing us to come. We are so happy to be here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I don't want to take very much of your time because the list is <laughs> like this. I was 39 years old when I suffered three straight cardiac arrests. The doctors gave me up. They told my wife, call a family. I'm still here. One of those doctors that treated me, well, in fact, uh, three of those doctors that treated me are already dead, and they were the same age that I am. And I just turned 80 years old. But I've also been healed of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, which occurred in, uh, uh, from April through uh, uh, 14 through March of 16. And I have to tell you this, I don't think that any of that would have ever come out like it did, except I was away from church for 23 years. When I quit church, I was a Sunday school superintendent, but it was dead inside. And I was gone for 23 years when I was drawn back by the Lord and he baptized me in the Holy Ghost and gave me the strength that I walk with yet today. Are there any other brave souls? Here we go. Well, most of y'all here know my story pretty much. I've been, been here a long time, so. Uh, in 96, they said I had throat cancer, and they told my wife, and tell me, she told me later, they gave me less than two years to live. God healed me of that. 2004, I had heart, I didn't know I had a heart problem, but I kept having like heart burn. And here, I was, at that time, I was driving a truck. And when I'd get done loading the truck and everything, I was hurting my chest. By the time I'd get, make my run and go wherever I had to go, it was gone. So I didn't think a whole lot about it. Uh, so finally, anyway, I told my doctor and they 
sent me to a heart specialist. Even he put me on a, a treadmill and all that. And they wouldn't even let me finish because they thought I was going to have a heart attack right then. And he told me after that, he said, if you'd had the heart attack on making the run, which is around here, he said, you'd have been dead before they ever got the EMS, I don't know, medics out to you because it would have been quick. Well, they operated on me then, fixed my heart, I put some veins in, opened it up, and took them out of my leg and put in new arteries and stuff. That was 2004. I'm still here. So I'm going to be here a lot longer. I'm 82 years old, and I'll be here 83 more. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, I'll just share the one that I think is uh, God's taken us through, you know, with seven children. He's taken us through a lot of sicknesses and illnesses. And uh, for those of you that are newer to the church, we used to not go to the doctors. Um, let me give you a little history about myself. Um, I was a wife, a mother, and a nurse for 50 years. I just retired from nursing after 50 years. Uh, and I retired at the age of 70. So I didn't retire young. I didn't retire early. I, I just said, I had prayed, Lord, I don't know when I'm supposed to retire, but I want to retire in your time, whatever time you want me to retire. Well, uh, in 1976, Yes, in 1976, uh, I had just, uh, I did quit work for a few years. I was going to stay home and take care of our three children, and Minerid was coming into the ministry full time. Um, I wasn't feeling well one day, and I went to Pastor Houseman's house and got prayer and came home, and what ended up happening was I hemorrhaged. I was having a miscarriage, and at the time, I didn't even know what it was. Well, the hemorrhaging started, and it would not stop. And I bled and bled and bled and bled and bled. Uh, my sister, who was a strong believer of faith, came over to pray for me, and she prayed for me, and um, uh, I lost so much blood. I'm, no, I'm very physically, I'm a strong woman. I've always been strong to be a female. I'm strong. Well, I fell to the floor because I couldn't stand up, didn't have any strength to stand up. So my sister prayed for me, and I was laying through a doorway. I'm just telling you this because I think it's funny. I'm laying through the doorway, and she prayed, and she claimed Ezekiel 16, 6, which says, when I saw you in your blood, I said to live, yea, live. And so she prayed that. She said, okay, now stand up. And I thought, well, that sounds good. <laughs> So I got a hold of the door frame. I was able to get a hold of the door frame and pulled myself up and I'm standing in the door and I let go and on the floor, just, just as quick as I let go, I was on the floor again. Well, anyway, I'm laying on the floor and um, uh, Minerid was still working as an electrician at that time and uh, my sister was there with me and she called the pastor and the pastor, Hanselman and Sarah came over and they're praying for me. And um, the pastor asked me, well, what's wrong? I'm laying on the floor and I can't move. And at that point, I couldn't see anything but black. I had my eyes open. I couldn't see anything but black. My, my vision was gone. And I said, it won't stop. It won't stop. It just won't stop. The bleeding wouldn't stop. It was just life was draining from me. Well, they called Minerid and he came home and I'm laying there while he's on the way and I'm laying there and I think this, this is probably the most important thing about this whole incident. I'm laying there on the floor, I'm bleeding. I can't see with my eyes open. I don't know if you have been around someone who is, who is near death but their breathing changes. My breathing was just like that. I would take... <laughs> So I'm laying there, and my mind is just completely lucid, and I'm thinking, oh, I was an emergency room nurse, and I'm thinking, Lord, I just quit working in the emergency room. I know every doctor, I know every nurse, I know all the EMTs in town. I know if somebody calls an ambulance, they will get, to me, get me to the hospital faster than you can blink an eye. 
I knew that just because I knew the people. And I said, Lord, I'm going to lay here. I am not going to say a thing. If you want somebody to call an ambulance, you tell them because I'm trusting you for whatever happens. And I had complete peace. I, I can truly say I had complete peace. Meinrad came home and he prayed for me. And, he, and remember what happened when my sister prayed. <laughs> I got up but didn't stay up. He prayed for me. And then he said, get up. I stood up. I walked to the bathroom. I came back out. And I sat in a chair. And that was it. The bleeding stopped. Over the next few days, God healed me, raised me up, delivered me, restored everything that's going on. And then in 1978... Miriam is born, right? 79, 79, Miriam is born. Yeah, 77, this was in the end of 77, so sometime next year, Miriam was born. And another thing, Miriam was born during the building of our first church, which I think is, you know, when I think about these connections, think about connections, what God's brought you through. Think about connections. I was pregnant with Miriam while they're building this church, and I would, come, I would fix meals for the, the guys that it was a family, a Christian family of builders from Indianapolis. It was a man and his sons. So I would, I would bring them food, bring them something to drink. Uh, there were even a couple of times when they said, hey, we need some uh, aluminum from over on the south east side of Louisville, go get it. <laughs> Here's my truck, go get it. So, uh, but, but I was carrying Miriam through all that. So, you know, you can take that for what you think it is. But, but anyway, I, had, I made the decision in my heart. I made the decision. God, I'm trusting you. Whatever happens, I'm trusting you. I'm not going to say a word. I knew I could intervene in the flesh and, and things would just... Well, actually, probably what would have happened, I wouldn't have lived to the hospital. I probably would have had a horrible time. But um, anyway, that and I had, after, after that, we had four more children. Everyone was born at home. Everyone was healthy and whole. They were good labors. They were good deliveries. You got to remember, that's back when we still weren't going to doctors. So, but anyway... Think about your testimony. What has God done for you? Testify of it. Proclaim it so God will do it again. And he'll even do more. I mean, I think that's just a beginning for what he wants to do. He wants to do more. So remember what God has done for you. Share that with your friends. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I thank you for this night. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for your, for your family. Father God, for the family of God, Lord, bring us together in unity. Yes, Lord, you're waiting for the unity of the body of Christ, Father God. Lord, we won't be uni in union physically because we're not all going to be in the same place at the same time, Lord, but we can be in unity in the spirit, Father God. Lord, stir up the spirit of God in us, Father God. Bring that unity, that, that one mind, Father God, that we walk in the mind of Christ, Father God. Lord, that we seek you for, for our problems, Lord, that we seek you, Father God, every day, that we spend time with you, Father God, that we, we desire your presence, Lord. Father God, that we feel, Father God, your heart for us and your heart for others, Father God. Lord, give us wisdom, give us direction, Father God. Lord, and lead us into the, to your righteousness, Father God. Lead us into our calling, yes, our divine destiny in you. Father, I thank you, Lord, for what you have done. I thank you for what you're doing. I speak a blessing over this body, Father God, and I just ask that you be with us, keep us, and, and allow us to fulfill our divine destiny in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus.